Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. The Equipping You in Grace podcast is a podcast about helping Christians develop a biblical worldview in a conversational tone about issues inside and outside the church. Now, for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys, welcome back to the Equipping and Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And with me today is my friend and our brother in Christ, Reagan Rose. Reagan, welcome back to the show. Hey, Dave, it's great to be here. I'm glad to be back on with you. Yeah, it's great to have you. Well, can you just catch us up on what's been happening since we last chatted? I think it was a few months ago now. What's been yeah. happening in your life, marriage, ministry, and what ministry products are you working on? Yeah, so we've been busy here in the Rose household. I don't, I don't remember what month we talked, if we had our third at that point or not, but we've got three little ones, um, four, two, and four months. <laughs> and so we've got our hands full with that. We're in the middle of uh, of moving. So we're, we're very busy with that on the life side, but ministry side, you know, we've, we've got, I know we're going to talk about it. We've got a new book coming out and uh, I've just been focused on redeeming productivity on the newsletter and, and serving people in our membership program, helping Christians to get more done for the glory of God. So just zeroing in on those things. Yeah, that's really great, brother. I enjoy your newsletter. So keep that, keep that up and look forward to seeing what's next. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I think I think you were just about to have your third. So, oh yeah, like a few days before we talked last. So. Okay, yeah. Well, Henry is here. He is. He is here. Yay. He's a sweet little guy, and his his brother and sister love him. So it's it's been fun. But uh, yeah, the first few months of having a little one, not as much sleep <laughs> mm. as we'd like, but uh, but we're praising the Lord and and enjoying it. Yeah, it's great. Well, can you uh, tell us about this book, Well Done, A Strategy for Life Stewardship, why you wrote it, how you hope it'll be received? Yeah. So it it's a book, as the title suggests, it's about stewardship and, and the title Well Done comes from Matthew 25, the, the parable of the talents, you know, the well done, good and faithful servant. And, and really, this is, I think, the logical extension of sort of my, my ministry, Redeeming Productivity, centers around helping Christians with personal productivity. But the idea is really about stewardship. How do we steward our lives, not just our finances, but our entire lives well? Because I, I really believe that is sort of the mission of the Christian life. Like we're here and, and, and we're waiting for our Lord to return. What do we do in the meantime? We be faithful stewards of whatever he's entrusted to us. So this book is really a deep dive. We, we center around the the parable of the talents, we go all over actually and study the topic of stewardship throughout the entire Bible. And there's some practical elements as well of, okay, how do you actually apply this? How do you steward your finances? How do you steward your time? That kind of stuff. So, so that's the idea is, is trying to try to impart to believers a really thorough stewardship mindset, because I believe if we, when we make that mindset shift, that's when we start to walk more faithfully. That's when things start to really line up in the way we think about our lives. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, uh, it's really a good book. It's very helpful. It's useful in, in the best sense of the word. And obviously it's practical in the best sense of the word. And I say all that because you grounded in scripture, which that makes it useful and it makes it practical. <laughs> that's the trick. That's that's the trick right there. Is if you yeah. don't have anything to say, just put the just talk about the scriptures and then you know you're gonna be on safe grounds. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. Every time. Every time. Well, uh, how does our disdain for genuine and biblical accountability driven us to endless diversions? Yeah, so I really believe we live in a responsibility averse culture right now. I think most of us would agree we we like to flee responsibility and, and you look at a lot of the major problems that affect our world, whether it's drug abuse or alcoholism or fatherlessness or all these different things. A lot of them are just traced back to running away from taking responsibility, which, you know, in the, in the context of stewardship is sort of the opposite of stewardship, right? Stewardship is a, a joyfully taking up the responsibility God's given us and, and doing that well, but we like to run from it. So, I think, you know, we look at those big things of, you know, like, well, I'm not struggling with alcoholism or this or that, but I think there's a lot more what Jerry Bridges would call respectable sins in this regard, where 
we run from accountability to a lot of times entertainment. And I don't think there's anything wrong with entertainment in of itself, but a lot of us, you know, maybe we bury our face in our in our phone way more than we should. Anytime something gets hard, I turn to I'll just watch a YouTube video or, you know, I'll just escape into my video games. And so I think that there's a big way where we we love diversion because it keeps us from responsibility, it keeps us from facing up to the heavy tasks the Lord has put in front of us. And I my caution is that we need to be wary of that. If if we take this stewardship mantle seriously, then we want to be like the author of Hebrews says, we need to cast off every weight that encumbers us. Uh, and, and so we can run this race well, even if that's stuff that's otherwise not sinful in of itself, like entertainment, but it's it's holding us back from being as faithful as we ought to be. Yeah, that's really good. I think one thing that you're touching on though is really important is that it's the fact that we're supposed to face reality as it as it is you know with god's help not to escape from reality but to you know face reality we see that you know that's why james is tells us at the opening you know consider it pure joy brothers when you face trials of various kinds you know knowing that the testing of your faith produces uh endurance and those kind of things you know that's and, that's so true you know it's it's so easy to just escape it you know and and you know paul we look at paul and you know, second Corinthians, I think it's 10. He tells us, you know, how many times he was beaten and scourged. And I mean, did, did Paul run away and, you know, just go into escapism? You know, it's a, it's a question. It's, you know, we all do it. You know, we all have right. our, whether you go to the news, like you said, uh, YouTube, I mean, we all have our own little escape hatch, you know, if you will, you know, th and there's nothing wrong. I think we would say with having hobbies or anything of that kind of thing, but do you, do you face up to the things that you have to in life? You know, this is why people go to, you know, uh, become enslaved pornography and, and mm -hmm. go down into drugs and other mm -hmm. things because, you know, um, you know, there, there is a real hurt in, in life, but like you, you could go to the book of Psalms even, for example, and you would see how the psalmist faced incredible hardship and then he still has hope in the Lord. So. Very well said. Yeah, I, I really think that's the crux of it is that that hiding, that escapism. And we just live in such unusual times because there's so many opportunities to escape that there really weren't before. I mean, how how would you, it could be in ancient times, like, like yeah, how would you escape the day-to-day -day realities of life? There weren't so many options to just like kind of zone out or something like that. So I think that's what makes our age uniquely difficult is the the opportunity for sort of these comforts and kind of to um i i guess you know uh hide under the bed sheets <laughs> you know whatever that looks like for you it really is a failure to face up to the reality of life and i was just talking to someone yesterday actually um who he's a a guy who He's not a believer. He's sort of a seeker. He's he's interested in Christianity and he's been following along with some of my stuff on productivity from a Christian perspective of all things. And he had questions about what it meant to be a Christian. One of the things we talked about is, you know, he had questions about the problems of pain and of evil and things like that. And I was like, you know, people will talk sometimes about blind faith, but in 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 one very real sense, Christianity is is not a blind faith. It is it's it's approaching the world with our eyes wide open. We look head first at trials and we say, I, I don't have to avoid this. I can go through it because Christ is with me. And I know that, that through the trial, he's accomplishing great things um, for my spiritual life and for his glory. And I, I love that about, about being, I love being a Christian, but I love about being a Christian that I can approach the hardest aspects of life with my eyes wide open. I don't have to run from them because I know the Lord is sovereign. And he's doing something through that. And, and I think avoiding responsibility is, is sort of this forgetting that no, we, we can deal with this stuff. We can deal with it by the grace of God. We don't have to go to fantasy land to, to escape it or pretend it's not real. That's really good, brother. Why is watchfulness so important to our stewardship as Christians? You know, watchfulness is kind of one of those words. Uh, I grew I grew up in the church, and I heard this a lot. I don't hear it as much as often, but I I, I would like to uh, I would like to state here that we need to uh, to recapture the word watchfulness because it's all over Scripture, right? This idea of being watchful, and 
you know, I mentioned the the book, the context is sort of the uh, the parable of the talents, but the context for the parable of the talents is actually Jesus's Olivet Discourse, right? And this is this this section of Matthew uh, through um, it's chapters 24 and 25, and it's all dealing with, you know, the final warnings, prophecies about what was to come. Jesus is sort of like giving his final words to his closest disciples before he, you know, goes to the cross, resurrects and, and, and ascends to heaven. So he's, he's kind of laying it all down for them. And he tells them about the coming destruction of the temple signs of the age to come, you know, the tribu- tribulations, the false Christ, false prophets. It tells them about his return, all of this stuff. And the message over and over again is their need for vigilance. Their name speci- specifically for watchfulness to be watchful because he's leaving. And so when you look at, you know, the the parable of the talents, for example, the whole thing is about the master goes away. That's that's what it's about. And in his absence, what will the stewards do? And the main thing is be watchful, be ready. You don't know when when the master is going to return, but there will be an accounting when he does. That's really the the thrust of the whole Olivet discourse. And so what does that mean? Okay, it's the whole thief in the night thing. We don't know when he's coming back. So we must be watchful. We must be ready. And so we don't as believers ha- have the luxury of pretending like we're just sort of in the waiting room for heaven right now. I think that's a lot of times we fall into the comforts of, of the modern age and just be like, okay, we hang out here. Christ will come back. Um, doesn't really matter what I do right now. I'll avoid the big sins, but when he comes back, I'll, I'll go to heaven and it'll be fine. It's like, no, there's work to be done and watchfulness being ready. That's, that's the word um, for be faithful now. Keep your eyes wide open. Um, be a good steward uh, because you don't know when the master is going to return. Yeah. And of course, we remember that, you know, the disciples fell asleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so, I mean, if, if we're against that context, we, we, if we remember that, you know, uh, that means, uh, did you fall asleep? Did, did you like just stay on the sidelines? And, yeah. and, and then you forget, maybe we forget about Peter. Since he didn't watch and pray, you know, Jesus told him, well, even before that, hey. He warned him him specifically, watch and pray that you do not enter temptation. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And then he fell into temptation. So, Uh yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's left there for us as we reread these things. Like that's for us. I really think that's a, a big missing component of modern Christianity is we kind of just think there's nothing to do. And it's just kind of like, okay, we're just, we're running out the clock on our life or something <laughs> until Jesus returns. Cause heaven's already secure, right. Through faith in Jesus Christ. So what do I do now? No, there's, there's still, um, there's still final judgment. There's still rewards to be, to be handed out. That's kind of the, one of the thrusts of the parable of the talents is he rewards faithfulness. And it's, and, and for me, I want to be faithful because I want to hear those words. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. And that requires me being watchful. That means being in the game, getting off the bench, recognizing that there's work to be done. And and not getting being on the internet arguing about the finer points of, you know, disputable divisive doctrines. You know <laughs> we could saying? do a whole episode you just know, on let's, that. Let's just yeah. let's just get our let's get our I mean, not that not that we shouldn't have theological conversation, but I think it's better off- offline, but you know, or or over Zoom, you know, if you're gonna have that. But I just, I just, it's just a point that, you know, gentleness, if you look at the fruits of the spirit, pretty much almost every time we're, we're to talk or anything, it's there, the fruits of the spirit are there. So I, I'm right there with you. I mean, like qualifications for an elder is that you're not pugnacious. You're not eager to fight. Like that's, that's part of being a mature Christian. You know, you don't, you don't love controversy. Like all these things are warned about. I, I could, I could go down that rabbit hole with you all day. I, yeah. I'm so tired. I'm, I'm barely on Twitter these days because all I see is brothers that I, that I agree with theologically, but acting in immature ways, arguing about doctrine. Um, and just like, guys, these are important discussions. You're not having them the right way, though. Not just because it's online, but because the way you're acting is immature and dishonoring to Christ and a poor witness. It's really disappointing. But the irony there, I think, is like how funny. I mean, how it, it, it speaks to the cleverness of our enemy that one of the things that could distract us from faithfulness is actually 
arguing about doctrine and and we're arguing about important things, true things, and we might even be right about our position on it, but we're acting unrighteously because we're not conducting ourselves as Christians. Uh, yeah. It's it's it very is, clever. That's one of the things that I, I I I say is you know our character informs our witness, and you see that throughout the New Testament. Amen. And we have to. We, what we too often care about is just our witness. You know, we equate our our wit, our faithfulness to our witness, and not to our character. And the New yes. Testament does the opposite of that. I think that's really foundational to to what stewardship is about. Yeah, I, really well said. I, that's that's very insightful. How should we How should we deal with a situation where we look at another Christian and you know how gifted they are, how many possessions they have? Hey. They even got a great podcast. They even, you know, have a great blog and they got hundreds of thousands of followers. And, you know, they look at that and like, what? I don't got that. You know, what what do you say to them? Yeah, I think that the parable of the talents speaks to this sort of indirectly. But, you know, there's there's a uneven distribution of talents, right? The master gives one was it, I think it's five, three and one. And so it gives them differing amounts to, to steward. And I don't think that that's inadvertent. I think Jesus includes that because that's true of each of us. I I have not been gifted the same way you have, you as well as me. We could all of us could look at someone and probably do. There's people we look up to and perhaps in our in our worst moments we're jealous of because we haven't been gifted the same way that they have. But our response to that I think belies our what what we think about stewardship, what we think about God's role in all of this. So I, I'd i say our response is you look at someone else and you're saying, okay, why don't I have that? Why haven't hasn't the Lord entrusted me with that talent, right? I think the first thing should be thankfulness. I think we should pause and just give thanks because Jesus is clear about this. The greater you've been, the greater amount you've been entrusted with, the greater your accountability and your responsibility for that is. So like, I would be thankful for my small stewardship because I don't want to be held accountable for something that's beyond my capabilities, right? <laughs> I think the other thing is, is secondly, not just thankfulness, but being content. And the way you can be content is recognizing that it is the Lord who apportions our gifts. He's the one who divvies out the, the talents, right? And I would rather trust his decision making in what he thinks I can handle and what I can be faithful with than my own, because I'm probably going to, you know, be too big for my britches and think, yeah, yeah, I would like to take on a um, a multinational, um, you know, or an international ministry with thousands of people or something, you know, like uh, like following me. It's like, okay, I I probably could not handle that, and so I would rather be content with what the Lord has given me. Um, and then the the third thing I think is just being diligent with what he has given you, right? Um, Jesus said this too. He who has been faithful with a little, little will be set over much. That's this principle, right? It's if you're always looking over the fence, grass is always greener. I wish I had what that guy had. Why isn't the Lord entrusting me with that? You're not going to be faithful with the, the talent he has given you. Instead, you focus, you say, thank you. I'll be content with this. And I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to steward this well. And we know with that principle that ultimately that's that's true on the eternal timeline, that our faithfulness in, in this life, we, we are rewarded commensurately with our faithfulness with what he's entrusted us. But it's also true, uh, it tends to be true temporally, like in a proverbial sense, that when you're faithful with little stuff, the Lord does open more doors for you. And that just happens. That's just a principle of wisdom as well. You read about in the Proverbs, you do you do little things well. And people will tend to entrust you with more. And so I, I think that's that's where the mindset of a stewardship steward can really save you from that discontentment or that jealousy. Mm, yeah, that's that's a really good word. You know, I think it goes back as well to just character. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, for a lot of people who, you know, I want to be sensitive because everybody wants to make a difference. But yep. what we don't what we don't forget, what we forget is you can make a difference just one on one. And pouring yourself into anybody just as much as you could make a difference having a podcast and a blog and writing a book and an article. And they're equal in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. I say it that way to be sensitive to the fact that some people look at, you know, people that are on radio and podcasts and do interviews and so on. And they write books and they're like, they're the ones really making a difference. It's like, well, the homes, the mom who's homeschooling is making a big difference. That's a mm -hmm. big, hard job. And anybody who, 
Anybody who says otherwise hasn't walked with a mom yes. <laughs> who is who is either single or married. I mean, I'm just saying, you know. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> but the 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 point there is, you know, we tend to equate again, you know, that large platform with somebody's maturity, and we don't know if they are spiritually mature or not. We don't know if they're humble or not. You know, they know the Lord knows. Um, and we we're too, I think we're one thing, one thing that I am been concerned about for a long time is we tend to equate somebody's success with their plug podcast blog, ability to speak, and so yep. on, and their charismatic personality, or even their education or their apparent education. I'll even say it that way. Mm-hmm. And then and then what do you see? Things happen, uh, life happens. How do they respond? Because mm-hmm. that's when you, that's when Eric Reed says, you see the person, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you see the person in, in the midst of, you see, we just talked about trials. That's when you see where the person's spiritual maturity is. Yeah. You and know? there's like, and, you can hide behind platform too. Like, the, you know, you, you hear sometimes about the stories of guys that, that had a major fall, right? They had a big, big platform and then they fell in a big way and you find out that no one knew them. They didn't have any deep relationships like there and the the character uh, wasn't known to anyone because they were just hiding behind um, breadth. They were reaching lots of people, but they weren't reaching a lot of people deeply. And I think there really is a there's a danger there. I think there's a trade off just to echo or pick up on the point you were making about folks who might look at someone with a bigger platform and say, oh, I wish that that seems more important. There is a trade off. I really believe this when the the broader you reach, the less deep it is. Like um, people who listen to to our podcast aren't gonna aren't gonna um, talk about a that th- we're not gonna be the people that they talk about. You know, they're not gonna show up to our funeral and be like they made a major impact on my life. It's going to be the people we went deep with that we knew and knew us deeply, and um, that that's important to remember. I, I remember listening one time Howard Hendricks, and he was talking um, to some guys who were. Uh, leading Bible studies. And one of them was asking like, well, what do I do if like, only, I, I set up this whole Bible study, invite all these people and the only two people show up. He says, you thank God, because now instead of dividing your attention to all these people, you can just focus on those two people and really pour into them, find out what's going on in their life. And that I used to do campus ministry that changed my perspective forever on that sort of, that sort of thing is I want to go deep with few people. I mean, I, I'm, I, I think it's helpful. It's useful to create resource ministries like, like you and I do, you know, and we've all benefited from these kind of things, but the mark of your life is going to be on those relationships you go deep on. And, uh, we can't forget that. Mm, yeah. You know, for, for me, when I was leading a Bible study, when we lived in Idaho, I just realized very quickly, nobody knows X number of person that I know. And the more yeah. I kept bringing it up, they're like, you know, but they want to know me. And then it hit me. No, they want to know me. They don't care yeah. about, you know, they don't even know who X number of person is. They might know one, like maybe yeah. John MacArthur or somebody like that, but you know, John Piper, but they don't know any, any of the other people. Mm-hmm. They, they, they know me. I'm there in front of them. I'm the one yes. helping teaching them. And if you keep that perspective, you know, who cares about the, the tens of thousands of article reads, podcasts, or whatever. It really is. It really is at the end of the day, like you're talking about, it really is all about just, are you going to have that mindset and the p- posture of your heart to be humble and just focus on serving the people that, you know, are listening and watching? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that's, and that's true. That's why I can say what we, what we said earlier it matters for the the single mom, the 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 homeschool mom. It matters for all of us where we're at. You know, that's yeah. why character matters. You know, I I can tell you. You know, and for me, it's like I don't need to be known in my local church. Um, I don't need to. You know, I I prefer to. You know, I I like to get to know people and those things and whatever. If they ask me what I do, I'll tell them what I do and they'll check it out. And then then they'll be like, oh, okay, so you're you do that, you know. And so Mm -hmm. things kind of change a little bit just because of that. But like, I don't go out of my way. Maybe when I was younger, I would have gone out of my way. Oh, you know what? I do this, you know, 
and it's it's a it's a subtle thing, but it it it's it's a it's a big thing because you know what people pick up on is this person all about you know it's like it's like you're a lawyer. Everybody might know that you're a lawyer, but do you tell them you're a lawyer, or do you brag about your your accomplishments because you did it? You know, mm-hmm. and people people know the difference. You know, you you can you know the difference, and so I've always just tried to, especially in my middle to now. You know, I'm I'm still early 40s. I don't really. T- I try hard not to talk too much about that unless people ask and or they know. You know, they expect me to share. You know that kind of thing. But it's it's a it's a mindset thing. It's a perspective. It's a it's a. I, I'm more concerned about you than you know about telling you, hey, you should check out what I do because you'll get. Yeah. Some, you know. And that's uh, that's an important thing, you know, that I think it requires a lot of intentionality. And well, that's well said. Yeah, you, you'd rather have your character be the thing that you're known for, not your accomplishments. And that's I, I think the biggest like uh, reality check for that. I've heard this from people is like with uh, I've heard um, interviews with like celebrities and they'll talk about how their kids have no idea you know, that they're, that they've been all these movies or something like that. And I love that. They're like, it keeps, it keeps you humble, but that's, that's so true. Just on the personal level, that's what matters. It's not your accomplishments, you know, about whatever the claim, whatever you accomplish like, that's not the big thing. It's who were you? And that's true in the final evaluation too. That's true in, from God's perspective is, is, is not, you know, did, did you speak at a conference or did you, did you make that big deal at work or all those different things? Like those are fun little things, but ultimately it's like, were you holy? Did you walk with me? Did you, did you grow where you were planted? Did you steward the, uh, the thing I gave you to steward? Did you do that, um, fully? Yeah, it's really good. You know, one thing I think that we need to talk about as well, not just, you know, be faithful and growing, but you know, our stewardship, you know, too many people are burning out these days. And yeah. so we need to talk about, you know, balancing our stewardship of spiritual matters with stewardship of er- more earthly matters, such as our health and jobs. What what kind of thoughts do you have on that, brother? Yeah, I th- I think, you know, like I said, the 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 focus of this is life stewardship. I, I think steward you should bring up the word stewardship in a Christian circle and people start thinking about, oh, we're talking about money. It's like that's part of it, but that's not all of it. It, the, in, even in the parable, of the talents, money is used as a metaphor. It's a metaphor for your life, right? So doing that well means being balanced. It's very easy. You know, I, I, I you know, serve the world of like productivity. Like I, so I talk about productivity and a lot of people uh, pigeonhole that to their work. And so balance becomes an issue. They're like, okay, if I'm going to be productive, well, all I need to do is spend less time with my family, never uh, exercise and, you know, just work, 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 work. And that, then that's, then I'm being productive. Then I'm being a good steward of my job. No, 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 no. If you're looking at it through the lens of how do I steward this life? Well, it means taking all those things into account. It means I have a responsibility in so many different realms. I have a responsibility in my family to my job. I have a responsibility to my church. Like there's all these things and my health is doing that well. And you can't do all of those things with perfect excellence. It's just not real. Like you can't, like you're not going to, not all those things are going to be perfect. So you got, you're going to have to be trade-offs and stuff. But I do think one big thing that's, that's helped me and I think can be useful for people is recognizing that your different parts of your life are not isolated. Faithfulness in one area tends to blend over to other areas too. Like, I I don't know if you've had this experience where when you're consistently reading the Bible, like it's easier to do other consistent good habits. Like my own experience as well too, is uh, there tends to be a, uh, a correspondence between if I'm exercising regularly I'm also more faithful in my devotions. I'm also more faithful in these other areas. So I think that's one thing is it's it's connected. Faithfulness, you don't, you don't just isolate it to one area. Um, another thing is recognizing you're not a disembodied spirit. You're not just a, a ghost and your your body's the machine and you're just operating it. Like stewardship, the, the, you know, there's a there's an aspect of that that does affect our, that our health is involved in and our, our bodies, you know, are a temple of the Holy spirit and we need to take care of them. And so doing all of those things together, I, I think it, it really, I guess the big word, the word I want to use is holistic. You have to have a holistic vision of your life as a stewardship. And that 
act of balance in, in reality is a constant act of rebalancing. And so that's, that's what I said. You, you never get to this point where you're like, I'm, I'm perfectly balanced. It's always constantly reassessing. You're saying, okay, I'm, I need to be doing better on the health thing. Ah, okay. I need to make some corrections over here because I am, I am not doing well on the family side. And that that's a constant, just walking with the Lord, constantly being reflective on which areas am I stewarding well, which areas am I falling short and, and doing the things that are necessary to get back on track with those. Yeah. I think that really highlights what we were talking about earlier about humility, because if we're not continually growing, you know, we're going to be stagnant, we're going to be apathetic. And so mm -hmm. we need to continue to evaluate things in a, in a, not in a morbidly introspective way, but in a, you know, in a, a balanced way through script, the lens of scripture. And you're really Absolutely. Just highlight, highlighting that. So I think that's good. I actually, I'll just note this, like on a practical note, this sounds kind of dorky because it is, but I grade myself. So I have, I use this, this, uh, I just call it domains of stewardship and just think about like the six major areas of my life. So there's like my spiritual life, my finances, my family, like all my health, all those. And I grade myself once a quarter on those just one out of five. And that's like, again, it's really dorky, but it, it, allow, it forces me once a quarter to look at that stuff honestly and be like, okay, the health thing is, is a one again. All right, we, let's make a goal. Let's create a new habit. Let's, let's do a course correction on that thing. And that I found just so useful to quantify it a little bit, even though, you know, you're making up the numbers and stuff, but it's, it's, it's looking in the mirror and being honest about where things are at. And then you can actually course correct. Do you ever ask your ask your wife uh, about you know how you're doing when you when you do that? Do you show her that too? Or no, <laughs> that's a dangerous <laughs> game. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. I, I'm just I thinking as somebody's yeah. listening, you know, and they do that. I would think that, and I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't. I'm just yeah. saying like it could be helpful to you know maybe get a little perspective there. I think yeah, that that is, is probably major. that is probably very wise. I probably should do it, but I haven't mm -hmm. I have not done that. I mean we talk about the, the our relationship side of things a lot. We have an open the dialogue on that. But it, that would be interesting, but a little bit scary. I, it would be interesting to hear what she thinks I'm doing. Do these grades match up with what you think? <laughs> it is it is scary. I'll be I'll be honest when I I'm like um so what did you think about that article? What did you think about that book? And I'm a little, I'm a little bit, she's like, she sits there and thinks she, she's trying to be gracious, <laughs> but truthful or, or, or I'll send her like, cause we have like this, we chat over teams cause uh, we both work from home. And so she's upstairs and I'm downstairs off the kitchen. And so I'll send it and she's like, no, uh, or she'll be like, no, on that graphic. You need to do this. You know, I'm always like, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's helpful. I mean, I'm not saying I do it all the time, but it's helpful, you know, to sit down and just say, how are we doing? How do you yes. think we're doing? And that, that's kind of what I more, I wasn't meaning like, oh, Reagan doesn't do that. So, oh, <laughs> no, I think I, I'm going to get convicted right on. Or, you know, I think I'm just right saying on. it is, it is painful, but it's, it's really, it's really helpful. You know, it's, uh, it, it also says, Hey, if we're not doing well, Let's talk about that. You know, let's, yeah, absolutely. It's better. And just the fact it. that we all have blind spots too. Like I, I'm not going to be the best um, at evaluating myself on a lot of things. Cause you just, you have this insider perspective and we're often, we often <laughs> tend to be a lot more gracious with ourselves than we are with others. You know, <laughs> some of us, some of us, <laughs> some of us, I, I can tend to kick my own rear end. So. That's true too. Well, you, you would need a correction. You would need a corrective in the other direction where you I, know I, your spouse or someone trusted would say, Hey, you're doing better than that. I think you are. Right? Stop it. Stop it now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Beating man. yourself up. Yeah, basically. So, uh, brother, what are some ways to know if we're using the full scope of our uh talents right now? What are and what are some ways that each of us can be more effective in using um our talents? Yeah. So I, I think it it that's one of the th big questions when you start talking about stewardship is the big question is what am I actually responsible for? Like in the parable, he tells them, or here's five for you, three for you, one for you. That's really clear. But in everyday life, it's not always super clear what I'm responsible for exactly. Like obviously there's some things like I'm responsible for my finances. I'm responsible for my family, but where it gets a little bit complicated is 
you know, in the actual talents, the way we tend to use that in the modern term, not in the, the monetary sense, it's used in the parable, but we talk about talent as in like a personal gifting, like how, like, what are my full scope of my talents? Am I using these well? So I think that's where it is helpful. Even, you know, this is a good coming off of the last discussion we just had. It's where it's hap- helpful to have some outside perspective, particularly if, if you're in a family with a spouse or parents um, or pastors or, or trusted people at church. They can tell you, hey, I, I think that you're gifted in this thing and you're not doing anything with that. I, you know, that that's helpful to have that perspective where people are saying, hey, there's something you're not leaning into here. And I think you could be more um, faithful in that area. I think another big thing too is um, seeking out opportunities, trying new things, even as an adult, you know, there's that expression, give it the old college try. That's because college is like the last time that you actually wanted to try something. Cause you, you know, once yeah. you're, once you're in your thirties, you're done being embarrassed, but I think try, <laughs> trying new opportunities, you know, and you often discover things that you didn't know that you were gifted in. I, I, I look back and um, I'm so thankful that, even as a young man, our youth pastor at our church gave me opportunities to teach and things like that. I don't, I would not have discovered that I had a gift for speaking or any of that stuff, except for I tried, I was given opportunities and I, and I said yes to them. And you start to learn, oh, Lord's, Lord's give me abilities in this area. What are some practical ways that a husband and wife can plan their finances for God's glory? Funny that you you bring it into the context of a couple because that is, it's an important thing. It comes up a lot. Uh, it's one thing when you're just trying to steward your own finances, but it does become more complicated when you're working together as a couple. And I, I'm just to be like brass tacks, insanely practical. You have to keep a budget. You have to keep a budget. And if you're listening to this and you don't keep a budget, um, you're, you've probably heard this a thousand times. You got to keep a budget. And I'll, I'll make an argument for it right now. Like, and it's Do just, it. it doesn't have to be super complicated, but like just having categories for what are you going to spend on groceries? What are you going to spend on giving? What All this stuff, right? This is so important to couples too, because financial stewardship doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen without planning. In fact, the Lord, even when you talk about the giving side of financial stewardship, we're, he says, each should give as he's decided in his heart is what the Bible says not under compulsion. That means pre-planning. That means having a budget. Like it implies you need to be budgeting, at least forgiving. And if you're going to be budgeting and forgiving, that means you need to be budgeting your other stuff too, so that you know you have enough to give. Okay. And I think, again, we keep coming to this thing about facing up to it. The reason we don't like to budget is because you have to face up to reality of the numbers and the numbers are never, you're like, oh, I have way more money than I thought I did. (laughs) It's usually the opposite, right? (laughs) And so budgeting makes you force up to the numbers and budgeting together as a couple makes you do that together. And having a budget will solve so many arguments before they happen because it gets you both on the same page. You know, hopefully, you know, b- believers aren't aren't getting divorces, but that's one of the main reasons. I think it's either number one or number two reason that's cited for divorces is financial um, disagreements, right? And mm-hmm. so getting that stuff under control where you know, here's how much money we have this month. So you're not like, oh, you, you, you're spending so much on groceries. Well, what's so much? We haven't agreed on what a number is. Oh, you spent too much on Christmas or not shouldn't we be spending more on Christmas? How much is enough? Having a budget solves those things in advance. And it mm. it does it all with this mind, if you're doing it in the right mindset towards, we're keeping these things under control so that we can give this much, right? Because yeah. we, we don't want to borrow from what we set aside for the Lord because we haven't been faithful with what we've decided um, we we actually need us a family to live on. So that's my case for it. You, you you got to keep a budget. That's going to save you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't, we'll go to RSC Sprawl. What's wrong with you people? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so let that be your motivation. Think about that for a minute. Just kidding. All right. <laughs> now, now we're back to being serious again, maybe. Um, but no, really, that's really, really good, brother. Uh, you know, one thing that, you know, I do is I just, I have a Word document and I just put in the numbers. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple, we get paid a couple times a month. So, you know, the first check usually goes towards the house. And then at the end of the month, it goes towards uh, the rest of the bills. And so yeah. I just have those laid out. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to be super, unless you're one of those p- people that's like super spreadsheet. I'm just like, dude, I'm not even joking. I have a Word document 
It has two things on it. We get paid twice. First one, the amount that we get below that, house payment, what's left over from house payment. Next check, amount that we have from the check, all the bills and at the end, that's what we have left over for, you know, it's for gro- then groceries and yeah. whatever gas. And it's like, it doesn't have to be, guys, it doesn't have to be a fancy thing. Just yep. when you get paid, the next one you get paid, boom, boom, boom. You know, keep it I simple. Usually put, I usually put in tithing there at the, you know, so as well in, in that factoring in that, but. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a good idea to put in the the groceries. For me, I just do it afterwards because obviously we're going to buy groceries. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, that's, whatever, that was one thing I was going to say too. Yeah, yeah. Is I always tell people like some people get intimidated because they'll start a budget and you, you open up Excel, you make this thing, you're saying, we're going to spend you know $50 on groceries this month or something ridiculous. And if you never budgeted before, you don't actually know where how much money you're spending. And then you blow the thing up by week one and you're like, this didn't work and you throw it away. So I always tell people, you get started in budget, just track spending. That's your first thing. You're not, you don't set any goals. You're not saying, oh, we're going to keep it under this month for like three months minimum. Just track where all your money is going in categories. You do that, then you get sort of because it average, you know, it's different each month, right? And you kind of get a good average after three to six months. You said, here's where our money's going. That alone by itself is enough to like, okay, now you're facing up to the numbers, right? You're being honest with where stuff's going. But then you're kind of like, okay, I think we could save money in this category. So now we're going to set a goal for we're only going to spend up to this month. But but don't just set a bunch of unrealistic goals and then it falls apart. Like that's that's why a lot of people are kind of down on budgeting. It's I think they they haven't taken the time to sort of get a bead on what their real expenses are. I think one other thing that you're touching on, um, just one last thought is this whole idea of talking through things. It builds trust Mm -hmm. and it builds friendship. And I can tell you, you know. My wife and I, we don't wear a ministry. I'm in ministry, which means, you know, we don't have the most amount of money. Um, and so we have to talk through things mm-hmm. and we do. And it, but it builds trust. It lets the other person know, hey, this is where we're at. We're going to have to buckle up this month because we don't have a lot of money, which means, yep. you know, we might not be eating the best, you know, and, and that, that's where we're at. And, you know, other couples are, the, at a different place and that's okay too. But the point is that I'm making is you, sh- you have to have those conversations and part of having a budget is, is sitting down and, and in this way, I kind of do like Dave Ramsey. I have other issues with that, but you know, having that budget and having that planning meeting is something that I think helps build that trust in that, in the yeah. relationship. And I think that's the point that I'm making is, is, is those kind of things, those kind of strategies require intentionality and they 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 really cultivate love and trust and i mean those are two critical vital uh things to a christian marriage so yeah absolutely well you know the the word steward right like it's um the greek word oikonomos was like a household manager and that's when you think about stewardship any kind but especially financial stewardship in that sense we're managing a household like you it's it becomes more than just a numbers game like i i like that idea that like me and my spouse were working together to man it's like a little it's our little business <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah, yeah. we we we're we're working on making sure this thing runs smoothly and we're in it together it's not about um uh like it's not about the stress that often accompanies finances or about retirement per se you know what i mean all these are factors in it but the main thing is we want to run our household well together and we're going to have conversations about that and we're going to budget and we're going to do this well. And we're on a team doing that task. Yeah. That's really good. Well, brother, where can people go to find out more about you on social media or otherwise? Yeah. The, the best place to go is just redeemingproductivity.com. There you can uh, find my articles, a bunch of podcast episodes, YouTube, but the big thing is um, you can, if you drop your email there, I send you a morning routine planner that kind of helps Christians with the the discipline thing of how do you how do you set up devotions you're going to stick with? How do you work exercising your schedule? Some of that practical stuff, but couches it in this idea of being a faithful steward. Um, that also gets you on my my newsletter where I send out um, tips and encouragement and deep dives on how to be more productive as a Christian and be a better steward of these lives. So it's just redeemingproductivity.com. Everything's there. 
And I'm I'm part of your newsletter and I enjoy it. So that means <laughs> that's that good. That's all high of praise. you should go <laughs> immediately subscribe. Just, you'll love it. <laughs> you'll, you'll like it. You'll like it. I'm just having a little fun, but you it, it's well done. But brother, uh, can you give us uh, a few takeaways as we ra- wrap this up today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I start this book, this well done book with a quote from Randy Alcorn. And he said, stewardship is not a subcategory of the Christian life. Stewardship is the Christian life. Uh, and I think he's right on there. If we get this right, this mindset of it's not my life, I belong to Christ. I've been bought by his blood and I'm here to serve him and all the stuff that I have, all the talents, all all of this time doesn't belong to me. It's to be used and employed in the service of the King of Kings. Everything else is going to fall into place. You will walk faithfully if you get that mindset of a steward right. Really good. Well, guys, we've been talking with uh, our friend, Reagan Rose, about his new book, Well Done, A Strategy for Life Stewardship. I encourage you to pick this up. It's a really helpful uh, book. It's, as I said, it's biblical, which means it's useful. It's practical, but it really is. It's it's full of lots of help. And uh, so I encourage you to pick it up and also check out uh, the work that uh, Reagan is doing at Redeeming Productivity. So thank you, brother, for your the great work you do. Thanks for having me, Dave. I really enjoyed the conversation. Me too. Thank you for listening to the Equipping You and Grace podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, rate us on the app, and share this with your friends and family on social media. If you want to find us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Servants of Grace, on Instagram at Servants of Grace, or by searching at Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this episode and many others like it on the front page of our website, servantsofgrace.org.